Welcome to the Babylonian Podcast. I'm Michael Light, and I'm a Second Temple Jewish literature junkie and a big time Bible nerd. And on this podcast, I provide the perspective of Jews that lived just before Jesus from texts that we have like the Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, Dead Sea Scrolls, Philo, and more. With scholars, sages, and scriptures, let's Bible on. In this episode of the Babylonian, we are going to be looking at the wisdom of Jesus ben Sirah, also known as the wisdom of Sirach, also known as Ecclesiasticus, uh, a, a, a text by many different names. Uh, we are going to be looking at it. It's actually one of the most popular apocryphons. Um, in fact, I was listening to a lecture by uh, Dr. David De Silva, who is a major Apocrypha scholar, and he was talking about how there were at least a hundred mentions of Ben Sira by the rabbis uh, in, uh, I believe, the Talmud, if not uh, just the Talmud, among the Talmud, Gemara, and other rabbinic writings. Um, and in fact, I've, uh, from the research I've done, Ben Sira seems to be uh, if there was one Apocrypha that would enter into the canonical scriptures, Ben Sira seems to be the number one Apocryphon to make it in. Now, um, I like uh, Ben Sira. I liked him more uh, the time I read him uh, before this time than this time. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, he does have a lot of good stuff to say, and then he also has things that... Um, really taint his character and uh, take away from him and just make him harder to read. Um, now, that isn't like a lot of him, but, you know, it's throughout. But anyways, we are going to be looking at Ben Sira in this episode of uh, The Babylonian. If you haven't already, make sure to check out the Introduction to the Apocrypha episode of The Babylonian. Uh, also, if you're wondering about the canonical status of the Apocrypha, go ahead and check out my second episode of Searching the Scriptures. Um, and that talks about the Apocrypha and its placement um, among the canon in the scriptures. Um, and then, uh, yeah, feel free to check out any of the other Apocryphans. If you like this one, um, you may also be interested in The Wisdom of Solomon, which was the last episode. It's also wisdom literature. In my opinion, it's 10 times better than Ben Sira, even though I do like Ben Sira. It's just um, very paradigm shifting. And uh, it even just gives just straight up um, uh, hermeneutical uh, explanations for um the Torah and the ten plagues and how those are all connected and how God uh, is just in his retribution. Um, but without any further ado, we're going to be jumping into uh, Ben Sirah. Uh, also, again, you can find uh, all my resources on the Apocrypha as I'm reading through it right now um, on my website, michaeljlight.com or also the Babylonian.com. This is in the show notes, just like everything else. Uh, you can go there. If you go to uh, works and writings and click on Apocrypha or the big picture before um, above it, then it'll take you um, to my Bible references that I've listed for Ben Sira and all the other Apocrypha before it. And I'm currently working on those after, um, but I've updated it ahead because my reading of the Apocrypha is ahead of the podcast, but you can also see uh, kind of my overview of it if you click on uh, just Sira, just because the name for this book is so long, I just abbreviated it as Sira, as many do. Um, but yeah, you can see all those notes uh, on my website, uh, so also feel free to check that out. Uh, I, I've been forgetting to say that earlier on. So uh, with that being said, uh, let me jump in. 
Um, and also just uh, note, I'm trying to remember to know all these things in these podcast episodes, but uh, Dr. David De Silva has been helpful in better understanding Sira as I've been listening to his lectures on all of these uh, apocrypha before I read them. And uh, also I'm reading the NRSV uh, Oxford Annotated Apocrypha. And so the scholar that uh, kind of did the introduction and annotations to Ben Sira that helped me um, understand him a little bit more, uh, his name is Benjamin G. Wright. So just wanted to give that credit there. Um, and without any further ado, let's actually jump into Ben Sira. Um, so like I said, uh, the name of the book is The Wisdom of Jesus Ben Sira. Okay, now there's a lot to say here. Um, first of all, uh, wisdom it makes it clear that this is a, a wisdom text. It's in the wisdom tradition. Uh, that's why it's similar to the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, and it's writing, and it's also, but it, it's actually earlier than the wisdom of Solomon. Um, it's one of the early, it's one of the earlier apocryphon. Um, but there's actually two different levels to it. Um, and I'll get into that into a second, but I, I do also want to mention that this is, and I'll talk about this more in specifics, but, um, it's, it's heavenly, it's heavily influenced by, uh, Proverbs, especially Proverbs one through nine. Um, not as much about, it doesn't have as much of a, a um, an emphasis on Lady Wisdom as the later Wisdom of Solomon, which is one of the reasons I love Wisdom of Solomon more. But it does talk about it and make reference to it. And he's certainly aware of it. Um, but that that was helpful for it. It, it does um, talk about a, a lot of the things that James, which is uh, the wisdom text that we have from the Apostolic or New Testament writings, it has stuff from that. And also the Sermon on the Mount, which... Um, James was influenced by, um, inspired by. And so uh, you'll see that many of those things are connected. Actually, I'm not sure that we're talking about too many of those, but there are connections. Um, James's thoughts, especially about the tongue and about gluttony and about being moderate, those um, definitely have connections to Syrah. Um, uh, also, so it's the wisdom of Jesus ben Sira. Now, the name Jesus, uh, as you see in his prologue, um, because ben Sira doesn't start with chapter one, it starts with the prologue and then chapter one. Um, so, Ben, if you know a little bit of Hebrew, means son of. So, it's really the wisdom of Jesus, son of Sira, which is why I'm naming this podcast Son of Sira. Most translations just say Ben, they just leave in the Hebrew there. Um, also, Jesus, uh, you know, it's the same name in Hebrew as Joshua and as the Messiah, Jesus, from the apostolic writings. It's Yeshua. And uh, as you find out in the prologue, uh, Yeshua, the son of Sira, uh, understood both Hebrew and Greek. And he's, in fact, this work is actually him translating the work of his um, grandfather, uh, in in verse in chapter fifty one, he talks about how he is actually Yeshua uh, ben Eliezer ben Sira. So he's actually actually Yeshua, the son of Eliezer, who's the son of Sira, because Ben can also be a more general term and just refer to uh, being a descendant of. Um, so he's the grandson of Sira. So what you get here is actually a reflection of. Um, oh, what you get in the main corpus, which is chapters 1 through 50, although uh, Yeshua very likely could have uh, added in his own little insights and prayers and additions throughout, um, that is the work of the grandfather, Sira. Um, in the prologue, uh, um, Yeshua just makes it very clear that he is, um, he makes it clear that he's just straight up, uh, I am the... Uh, the grandson or the descendant of Sira. Uh, he actually says that later in, in chapter 51. And he talks about how wisdom has been a help for him. I'll, I'll get into that. And in the prologue, he talks about um, kind of his purpose in writing again and, and how he, uh, how his grandfather had studied what he calls the law and the prophets and the others that followed them. Now, this is interesting. This is 
the first reference to kind of a closed canon. Um, so if you didn't know, uh, in Jesus's day, Jesus uh, and the apostles uh, did not re- have the word Old Testament. That was not a word of their time. Uh, how they talked about, quote unquote, the Old Testament, I prefer the term Hebrew scriptures, uh, is they use the term the law and the prophets um, because all of the people that wrote the scriptures were seen as prophets. Moses was a prophet um, because they were inspired. They were inspired by God. Uh, inspired means it's in, inspire from spirit. Uh, it's something that God puts his spirit in. So God had put his spirit in the authors of the scriptures. So all the authors of the scriptures um, were prophets. And you'll see that in other Second Temple Jewish text they just refer to these people as prophets all the all the authors of the hebrew scriptures um are prophets so anyways um ben sira um he he references the law and the prophets it's a tripartite it's a it's a threefold division of the ancient old testament there's the law the prophets which is the former prophets which is um uh, joshua judges not ruth um Samuel, uh, and Kings, and not Chronicles. Um, so that's the major storyline up until exile. And then uh, you have what's called the, the later prophets. Um, those were the former prophets. Then you have the later prophets, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And then you have all on one scroll, the 12 minor prophets. And then you have the writings, which is uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, and then you have the, the five books, which is going to be Esther, Song of Songs, Ruth, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations. And then you have three more texts that are um, exilic. You have Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah as one text, and Chronicles as one text. Anyways, those last um, books from Psalms to Chronicles, um, again, they have a different ordering than we do, are called the writings or the ketuvim. Uh, Jesus kind of uses the synecdoche many times when he refers to them. It depends. Sometimes he just says law and prophets. So he's just talking about those two, but he's really talking about all of them. And sometimes he says the law, the prophets, and the Psalms of David. The Psalms was the first part of the writings, and um, there are five books in the Psalms that uh, correspond to the five books of the Torah. And so the Psalms is like the the major piece of the Ketuvim, and so it kind of represents all of those. Obviously, he's not leaving those out as saying that those lead to him, because when he uses that term, the most famous part is from Luke 24, um, I believe it's 44, Um, but yeah. So anyways, um, this is seen as the earliest um, reference to uh, that tripart division and a canon, which is important, um, because it excludes the apocrypha it's an apocryphal witness to the fact that there is no apocrypha that the hebrew canon had been closed so as to say Um, but you could say that he was just referring to in saying that others that followed them he's saying that oh there's a possibility that others are still adding on um i would disagree with that i think that's possible his statement is a little bit more vague than you know i might like it to be um but it seems to me that he is referring to a threefold division in a closed canon. Anyways, he talks about um, these teachings and uh, that it's necessary not only to read these scriptures and understand them, but also um, through spoken and written word to help outsiders, is what he says. And so he says, so my grandfather, uh, Jesus, who had devoted himself especially to the reading of the law and the prophets and the other books of our ancestors and had acquired considerable proficiency in them, was himself also led to write something pertaining to instruction and wisdom. Uh, So that by becoming familiar also with this book, those who love learning might make even greater progress in living according to the law. Um, So um, he talks about his grandfather, uh, Jesus. It looks like I've I've switched these up. I guess I've had these switched up the whole time, to be honest, because I thought it was the other way around. Jesus, Ben, Sira. Yeah, I always thought it was the other way around. Okay. Anyways, either way, um, man, it, either way, the grandfather had written down 
uh, what he had written down. And um, he, he had read and he had understood the law and the prophets and the writings, and he had studied them. And uh, he actually taught a school for scribes, as you'll see throughout this. This is very much, um, it's very important for um, Sirah to talk about uh, the, the scribes and the, the role of the scribes and for uh, the priesthood. The priesthood is very important for him and, and ritual sacrifice and all that. That is very important for him. And so is, uh, as scribes, of course, they study the uh, Tanakh. That's the Hebrew scriptures or Old Testament. And teaching is also important for them. Uh, pretty much his statement is, you need to not just read the Hebrew scriptures and learn from them, but you need to learn from others that have learned from them. And since uh, his grandfather Jesus had taught from them, so he wants to make that teaching more available. Because by his day, uh, not as many people were speaking Hebrew. Um, a lot of them had, were speaking Greek by that time because of, uh, you know, Alexander the Great taking over. And so he wanted to make his writing and his teachings more available. Um, and so he invites the people to read. And uh, this is actually interesting. He says, um, what was originally expressed in Hebrew does not exactly have the same sense when translated into another language. Not only this book, but even the law itself, the prophecies and the rest of the books differ not a little when read in the original. Um, so, you know, uh, around this time, um, or soon after, I really can't remember the date for, uh, the translation of the Torah into Greek, which is, um, uh, called the Septuagint, uh, especially when it refers to the later books that were translated into Greek with it. Um, there was a kind of a, it, it seems to me that there was a, a debate going on. Uh, I was mostly exposed to those that... Uh, followed the other side of the debate. Josephus and Philo and Aristeus all have writings that refer to uh, this translation of Greek of the Hebrew scriptures, um, of the Torah specifically, where uh, in Aristeus' account, that's the most extensive one. It's called the Letter of Aristeus. Uh, he writes that there were uh, six people from each of the tribes of Israel which, you know, they're obviously over-glorifying this account because, you know, only um, two or three of the tribes are actually left um, totally intact and, and not having mated with other people. Um, but he, he, his claim is that six were taken from each tribe um, by a Ptolemaic king, and the king called for, him to, uh, called for each of them uh, to translate... Uh, their their scriptures, the Torah, into Greek, and uh, they all went off. And I think uh, I may be, um, you know, conflating a bit of the t the traditions. The traditions are there were at least seventy or seventy two, six from each, or there were just seventy. Either way, they were all paired off um, two by two, and each went to his own room. And over just a very few days, they all uh, translated the, the Hebrew scriptures, and then they came out and compared it. They all translated the Torah, and look, they all had the same exact words written in Greek, the same translation. And so uh, that must have been a miracle, um, because there's no way, like, if you know anything about languages, especially if you speak any amount of a second language, you know that there's multiple ways to translate anything. And so to translate an entire book, totally and completely the same, is absolutely ridiculous. So pretty much that's their argument for uh, these scriptures being inspired. So they saw the, the translation of the Septuagint being inspired. And while Ben Sirah doesn't specifically say that it's not inspired, uh, he seems to say that uh, what's originally written in the Hebrew, it doesn't have the same sense in another language, in Greek. So he's already struggled with translating his uh, grandfather's writings. And um, he, seeing that, he says that uh, he doesn't just apply it to his grandfather's uh, writings, but he also says not only this book, his grandfather's writings, but even the law itself, the prophecies, and the rest of the books differ not a little when read in the original. So that seems to be an argument um, against the Septuagint being inspired, um, which, of course, a lot of uh, rabbinic Jews tend to follow, especially when the Christians got a hold of it. But that's a that's a whole different debate. Um, but Ben Sirah here weighs in on that. And 
um, according to my resources, he's one of the earliest people to just kind of say, uh, you know, these uh, translated into Greek, he would say it seems that it's good. It's good that they're translated into Greek because it's good that people learn them and meditate on them. Um, however, it seems that they don't have the same weight, um, or at least that they don't have the same sense when they're translated into Greek. Again, this is open uh, a little bit, but it seems to me that it, it's at least weighing more towards the Septuagint not being inspired. Anyways, all that being put aside. Oh, uh, yeah, another thing that I forgot to uh, add in here is that uh, another term for this book is Ecclesiasticus. This is a much later date. Uh, a much later name um, given to it, but it, it, if you know a little bit of Greek, you know ecclesia is uh, congregation, gathering, the church, and so uh, it was called the book of the church um, because later on the church really valued it because it just has a lot of very practical uh, wisdom. Um, and yeah, anyways, it doesn't have a very rigid design. It's just kind of... Um, yeah, for the most part, it's just kind of clumps of different proverbs and maxims that are applied to different subjects based on um, the different groupings. So, um, but yeah, actually, if you look at um, any, uh, pretty much any Bible today, pretty much all of them have uh, subtitles, usually in italics over areas that may say what the general idea of that uh, part of the text or couple paragraphs is about. Um, and that is all artificial. Like, that's added into the text. That's not part of the original text, just like, uh, spoiler alert, chapters and verses. Those were added, um, I think, in the 16th century. Anyways, um, except for, of course, the Psalms. The Psalms were broken up. There's a debate on how they were broken up. Um, and obviously the, the sub headings there that say who, the, who wrote the Psalm and the circumstances thereof, those are also original to the Psalm. But, uh, this text likewise in the Greek has, um, subheadings that are original to it. So anyways, uh, in 1830, for example, there's a subtitle that says self-control. And this section is all about being moderate in how much one does. It says, uh, do not follow your base desires, but restrain your appetites. Uh, this section talks about uh, food and money and relationships. And while all these things are good, uh, they can become a problem for anyone who's led away uh, by them or abuses any one of them. Uh, and so you may desire to uh, have riches and then you become poor because of your misuse of money in uh, spending it all and obtaining more stuff and becoming materialistic. In relationships, you can uh, start out by over trusting someone and then uh, because you put too much trust in them, you uh, share secrets with them that shouldn't be shared and uh, you know you ruin your relationship. Uh, uh, on the other side, you know, you can gossip or, or speak about something behind somebody else and somebody can overhear you and gossip and, and share that gossip with them. Uh, either way, uh, the best thing is to control yourself. Now, this is a pretty short section. It's just from 1830 to, uh, 1917. Um, so it's not that long and it doesn't say when the section ends. Uh, these sections don't go from section to section. So the first cutoff where it says self-control, the first subtitle, um, doesn't go all the way until the next one. The next one is until 2027. Um, and it's it's just called Proverbial Sayings. Uh, it's really not different from the rest of the book. It's just sharing uh, wisdom and asking for forgiveness and doing justice for those in need. Um, Ben Sira, uh, just like Tobit, is also emphatic about uh, giving palm, uh, giving alms, and giving to the poor. Uh, in the days of Ben Sira, the the literacy rate was probably less than ten percent. So, being that he was teaching um, a school on um, for the Hebrew Scriptures, he, um, sorry, being that he was teaching a, a school for scribes. He was teaching people who were in the upper class. And so uh, this is really directed towards them. 
And now that doesn't really make it very irrelevant for us if, I mean, if you're living in America in, uh, you know, the amount of wealth that we have compared to the rest of the world and that we're literate and such. But anyways, in his days, um, he wouldn't have been teaching any poor people. You, you just weren't a poor person that knew how to read and made it up into scribes, scribal school. So he's teaching kind of the upper class, at least the upper middle class. And uh, for him, it's important to share and give to the poor. Um, in chapter 30, uh, Sierra offers practical advice on how to bring up children. Um, it's called about, about children. He says, discipline them throughout their life so that they grow up in wisdom and know right from wrong. And he, for him, he doesn't, he does not lay back on this. Like you can really discipline these people to save them, um, from be, being given over and becoming spoiled, uh, if he's spoiled, he'll grow up not knowing how to live his life. He'll be like a wild animal, rebel against his family, and bring shame. Um, and so you got to teach him right, and uh, you know, don't spare the rod. Better safe than sorry. So um, give in to the disciplines. And uh, Proverbs uh, does talk about disciplining your child, um, but Ben Sira, in my opinion, he seems to take it a, a little bit further. Maybe not so much so, but uh, he seems pretty serious about this. Um, and th this also brings me to another very um, important part of Ben Sira. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, in the, the the ancient culture, ancient Hebrew culture, uh, and this is really brought out in, in Sira's writings, which is why I'm only bringing it up now, is that there was an honor-shame culture. Uh, and so it, it's not really about peer, peer pressure and this is bad because everybody says it's bad. Um, that wasn't looked down as bad. There were uh, kind of cultural norms um, that if you went out against them, it's not just you being some revolutionary that people can look up to and be inspired by. Uh, no, you're bringing shame, not just to yourself, but you're bringing it to your family and to your community and those associated with you. And this is something that is very serious for Ben Sira. And so that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, teaching your child right in the beginning is so important um, is because of uh, the shame that you can just bring on your family because of that. Um, and that's also why he talks about um, being very careful with women. So like, for example, in chapter 22, he kind of talks about the importance of raising up a daughter and how uh, that can bring a lot of disgrace because... Um, uh, she is, in in Ben Sira's mind, she is more sensual and can um, is more vulnerable to that. And so uh, it says some, some pretty um, difficult things to make sense of. Uh, like in 22 verse 3, it is, the, it is a disgrace to be the father of an undisciplined son. And the birth of a daughter is a loss. Um yeah, he pretty much, uh, he does have, you know, an honor-shame culture. It's not a bad thing, um, but Ben Sira, just in his overprotectiveness, is um, just straight out uh, misogynistic. Um, even later in chapters 25 and 26, he has a lot to say about uh, a good versus a bad wife. Of course, that's according to his own judgment of what's good and what's bad. Um, but uh, he is um, not a very big fan of bad wives. Like, uh, he thinks that they're lesser than um, good people. Um, well, first of all, he thinks that they're in inherently more seductive. He talks about uh, in 2521, not being ensnared by woman's beauty and not desiring her for her possessions. Um, he talks about in verse 24 of that same chapter, uh, from a woman, sin had its beginning, and because of her, we all die. Allow no outlet to water and no boldness of speech to an evil wife. If she does not go as you direct, separate her from yourself. So pretty much uh, divorce is permissible um, if your wife is being disobedient and uh, the men need to be in control and uh, the women... Uh, it's a woman who brought sin in the first place because she gave in to her desires and her passions. And so you need to be very careful of that. 
Now, it does talk about a wife being a good blessing, you know, of course. Um, but he, d he does not hold himself back from saying that, uh, just straight, from just straight up saying that women are worse than men. Uh, for example, in chapter 42, verse 14, he says, Better is the wickedness of a man than a woman who does good. It is women who brings shame and disgrace. Um, yikes. That's pretty... Uh, that's just, you know, and when you read ancient texts like this, you have to, you have to always keep in mind that these people... Um, they had different standards and uh, different things that they emphasized, and, and in a lot of ways, they were um, they were much more moral than us, um, but in other ways, not as much. And even people like Philo of Alexandria are, are quite misogynistic, but um, even for his day, Ben uh, Ben Sira is um, pretty uh, pretty anti women. Anyways, that's for me. That's a, that's a pretty big turnoff. Um, to be honest, uh, I still like Wisdom of Solomon more, just for its um, wisdom and its implications. Um, but I, I and I do like Ben Sira, but you know there are parts like that that just make you weary of him. Um, anyways, uh, just after the part on on children, Ben Sira goes into um, food. He talks about how food can comfort you when you're sad, um, but ultimately uh, it, its effect doesn't last and sorrow stays and can destroy your life. So be careful not to overeat. Um, and then at, at the end of uh, his writings, Sira uh, crowns it all off with an epic eulogy to his ancestors. And this is in starting in chapter 44, um, and it starts in verse 1. It's called uh, the hymn uh, in honor of our ancestors. And pretty much this goes all the way um, from Enoch to, um, it goes all the way from Enoch down to... Uh, Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, so the people who returned from exile. So first of all, it talks about how because Enoch was righteous, he was taken up to be with God. Um, and then it says that Noah also followed God, so he's kept alive during the flood. Abraham was righteous. Um, and this is very interesting. Ben here even s mentions that Abraham lived by the Torah of Moses. Um, and this is a, a common motif in, in many Second Temple Jewish texts. They talk about uh, Abraham and the patriarchs, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, having the Torah and living by the law even before the law was there. Um, that is, in fact, one of the points of one of my favorite pseudepigrapha named Jubilees, is showing how these patriarchs lived by the Torah. They just had such a high view of the Torah um, it was almost scandalous to believe that the patriarchs would have lived without going by its laws, um, which kind of goes against one of Paul's arguments that uh, even Abraham didn't have the Torah and that the Torah was just uh, revealed uh, gradually and according to circumstances. But anyways, that's just a, an interesting thing that Ben Sira shares with some other Second Temple Jews. Um, but yeah, God chooses to bring blessing through his family, through Isaac and Jacob. And I'm going through this much faster. Um, there, It goes in more depth on quite a few of these than I'm giving it. It goes all the way until chapter 50. That's six chapters right there. Uh, it talks about Moses performing miracles, meeting God face to face to receive Torah. And then it goes into talking about Aaron and uh, how he's holy and the first priest. And I think it says he's like the third greatest person. Um and again, Sira puts a special emphasis on Aaron's job as a priest because um, he loves priests and he's a big fan of the sacrificial system and the pre priestly rituals. And um, so he talks about how God established him as a priest forever. Um, he talks about Phineas, uh, who was a, a big, um, a big hero in the day of Ben Sira, and 
the Maccabees, because uh, if you didn't know him, he's a maybe a little bit lesser known hero from Numbers, who when the Israelites are all um, marrying and intermingling with the pagans, the, the non-Israelites, one is doing it right in front of the tabernacle, and uh, God's wrath is coming forth, and Phineas comes forward, and he just, um, with a, a spear, uh, just stabs straight through an Israelite and a pagan woman, and uh, holds back God's wrath, and God blesses him. Um, and God gives him a covenant, and Ben Sira thinks this guy is awesome. Uh, so do the scriptures, but Ben Sira uh, makes a point to uh, he makes sure to point out the priests. So then it honors Joshua and Caleb for standing up to Israel, the judges, the prophet Samuel and Nathan and David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Hezekiah, Isaiah, Josiah, Ezekiel, Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, the 12 prophets. Um, anyways, notice how this whole hymn is just replaying the whole story of the scriptures from Enoch to Israel to exile and then back to the second temple. Well, then at the very end, it interestingly goes back to Enoch again and mentions, and then it mentions Joseph and Shem and Seth. Um, and then it talks about Adam as the most honored human, which is uh, an interesting point that the annotations don't talk about. And um, I'm not really sure where he gets that from. I guess it's just because he's the most direct uh, uh, image of God. But anyways, then Sarah goes into talking about uh, Simon, son of Onias, who was a priest in his day. And he uses language from earlier in the hymn, talking about the robes of Aaron in, in his priestly place. Um, and he talks, he uses this, and he also uses language from um, chapter 24, which I'm about to get into, and uh, which is like a picture of wisdom. And so he talks about Simon as being an embodiment of wisdom and like a, 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 a falling after the archetype of Aaron. And uh, he sees Simon kind of as this an example of a priest living in the wisdom of the Torah and faithfully representing Israel um, according to its commands by teaching the Torah to others as a priest should and giving up sacrifices. Um, this is kind of the summit of his writings, because remember at the beginning, he talks about uh, the importance of, of meditating on uh, the Torah and the, the prophets and learning from them, um, and then teaching that to others. Well, as a priest, he talks about how that, that job was given to Aaron as a priest, and Simon, in his own day, is, is doing a great job at that, and he's a big fan of that. And so that's kind of the conclusion the, the conclusion of, of Sierra's writings. And there's just a little bit more after that that's just various stuff, just two big kind of stanzas. Um, and then after that, we get into Yeshua's writings. Um, and this is what he says. Um, he says uh, in uh, chapter 50, verse 27, Instruction and understanding and knowledge I have written in this book. Jesus, the son of Eliezer, the son of Sira of Jerusalem, whose mind poured forth wisdom. And he talks about the importance of gaining wisdom. And then he goes into uh, what's called the prayer of Jesus, the son of Sira. And uh, he, he, thanks God, he thanks wisdom for protecting him from danger. Uh, he thanks God for protecting him from danger, sorry, and uh, for giving him wisdom. He speaks of how God saved him through his many dangerous journeys in his life. When he, cared on, uh, when he only called out to him and asked for his protection, he would pray and look for wisdom and decided to let wisdom guide him in how he lived his whole life since he was young. Um, anyways, like I said, there are other uh, just various ideas scattered throughout this, um, talking about not going into debt, giving to the poor, managing money well, marriage, friendship, businesses, and how to maintain them. And a lot of his advice is really applicable and good and just straightforward and relevant. Um, but anyways, these two uh, parts, the, this, um, the conclusion of uh, Sira's or Yeshua's, apparently I'm confused because these, these headings, he says uh, in 27, in 5027, Jesus, son of Eliezer, son of Sira. So it seems that Jesus is the grandson of Sira, but in the prologue and in the subtitle to 51, it says 
prayer of Jesus, son of Sirah. Uh, no, sorry. In the prologue, it says that he was actually, that, that Jesus was the grandfather. So anyways, it's a, it's a little bit confusing. Uh, I think that Jesus is the, the, the grandson, but um, maybe that's just me. Uh, anyways, there's the conclusion of the, the hymn of our ancestors, which is the only really rigidly designed part of this, uh, that concludes with Simon, a contemporary picture of what it looks like to live in the wisdom. And then after that, you have uh, Jesus himself, the grandson of Sirah, sharing how wisdom has protected him and been with him his life because he called out to God and asked for it. And so it's about this importance of, of getting wisdom from the Tanakh and also prayer, which he talks about, um, and uh, applying it to your life and living by the wisdom of that and, and being able to, uh, by the stories in the scriptures, gain uh, wise principles that you can apply to every part of your life. Um, and this is this is really a, a, another really good part. The hymn of the ancestors is, is really good. Um, but then also in, in verse 24, there's a subtitle for this part called The Praise of Wisdom. Now this book is 51 chapters long, so it's one of the longer, if not the longest, apocryphon. I'll have to relook through. Um, I think maybe one as dress might be close, uh, but I can't really remember. But anyway, uh, it's at, chapter 24 is at the very center of the book. And it first shows uh, Lady Wisdom giving herself glory by speaking of how she was created. Uh, she was created first. She filled the world. She eventually looked for a place where she could live, and she saw Israel. And she continues to speak to herself as kind of being the very presence of God who spoke with Israel in the tabernacle and who was brought up to Jerusalem. Then she's pictured as this tree that grew up and sprouted and called to everyone to come to her and eat from her fruit. Uh, notice how this is very close to uh, Proverbs, where Proverbs talks about uh, wisdom being a tree of life. It talks about uh, wisdom calling out in the streets. Um, anyways, uh, in verse 23, Sarah says that wisdom was the very book of the covenant of the Most High God, the Torah that God gave Moses. Uh, so for Sarah, the embodiment of wisdom is a book. It's the Torah. And uh, this is actually very common in, in other places. Like in even in one Enoch, there's just, I, I think it's just one little, very small poem. Maybe it stands along that talks about wisdom looking for a place um, on the earth and settling down and then being rejected and then going back up into heaven. And I think this is often um, seen as being the Torah. But, um, and uh, take this with a grain of salt, but my understanding is it seems that some put much more, the, the more uh, rabbinic Jews put more emphasis, and Sira tends to lean more towards uh, rabbinic Judaism, it seems, um, he's definitely favored by that, unlike the other Apocrypha. He seems to put more emphasis on wisdom as being found in the Torah, and the Torah being the embodiment of wisdom. Um, whereas Hellenistic Judaism that you see, for example, in Philo of Alexandria and in the Wisdom of Solomon talks about more about wisdom being a person um, who nonetheless is somewhat abstract, but uh, they very closely connect it with God a, much more than these other people. And so maybe it's not so much a debate in that one would disagree with the other. Uh, it seems to me that the Hellenistic Jews probably would agree that the Torah is, at least in one way, an embodiment of wisdom. But they would also say that wisdom is something that's kind of this divine mediator between God. Uh, it seems to me that uh, wisdom and the Logos are so closely connected uh, in their thinking as being this, uh, being like distinct from God and yet an image and representative of God. Um, and, and Sira just really pushes into it being the Torah. Uh, and that seems to me to be the difference. Um, and obviously as Christians, we believe that Jesus is the embodiment of wisdom. As Paul just directly says in 1 Corinthians, Jesus is the wisdom of God. Um, 
And so there's much more emphasis on uh, that Hellenistic perspective in Christianity. Uh, like you see, the, uh, the Lagos was with God and is God in uh, John 1. That's just straight up the ideas that you see in Philo, except, well, actually, in Philo, the Lagos is... Uh, a God, not the God, um, but it is uh, a divine mediating principle. And John just takes that to the next level by saying that it is God proper. So anyways, um, she uh, is also connected to, she's also talked about as being um, the four rivers that flow out of Eden. So she's giving that Eden life and uh, you can come and drink from her and, and receive true life through wisdom that's found in the Torah. Um, and so, yeah, that is the wisdom of Yeshua, the grandson of Sirah. Uh, I did want to point out uh, a couple of the things that I found in here that were pretty interesting that I noted. Um, ben Sirah seems to have a, a greater emphasis on free will. Um, as I saw in uh, chapters 15, 14 through 16, let me turn there real quick. Uh, he says, it is he who created humankind in the beginning and left them in the power of their own choice. If you choose, you can keep their commandments and to act faithfully is a matter of your own choice. He has placed before you fire and water. Stretch out your hand and choose for whichever uh, will be given and whichever will be given. Um, it, in that day, there was some who uh, put more emphasis on choice and some who put less so. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, at least when it came to uh, salvation, they saw it not so much as a choice, but that some were, uh, as you might say today, unconditionally elect. And um, Ben Sear is very much, he's emphatic about the uh, necessity of free choice and either living by wisdom or uh, not living by wisdom, that is up to you. Um, in chapter 7, verse 33, he also talks about uh, not holding, withholding kindness from the dead. Now, again, this isn't explicit, um, but I, it, it, it's very interesting nonetheless, especially since in Tobit it talks about laying food on the graves of the dead. Uh, it seems that uh, Sira might be thinking of um, maybe giving to the dead. Anyways, there's some kindness that you can do to the dead in Sira's mind, which is um, very interesting. Um, in chapter uh, 23, verse 10, it says, uh, as a servant who is constantly under scrutiny will not lack bruises, so also will the person who always swears and utters the name. Uh, it seems that it's referring to the divine name here. Uh, so Ben Sira is against using the name of God, uh, which is uh, interesting, you know, because of course in Jewish tradition today, you don't really say the name Yahweh. That's, um, it's just, it's very offensible uh, to some degrees more than others in certain traditions. And some of them, as you've probably seen, don't even spell God, but we'll just do D uh, dash D. But uh, Ben Sira is definitely, uh, this is the most explicit reference I've seen to not uttering the name. And it's uh, pretty early. I think the, um, this is uh, early second century BC, if I remember. Um, so that's just uh, really interesting. Um in chapter 24, um, 33, uh, it says this, I will again pour forth teaching like prophecy and leave it to all future generations. Um, and so this is, again, this is part of the uh, hymn of the, uh, sorry, not the hymn of the ancestors, uh, but this is wisdom speaking and she talks about prophecy speaking through all generations. Um, so it seems to me that uh, Ben Sira may have believed 
that there was some type of prophecy that continued on even past again he's talking about it seems that he's talking about the closing of the canon earlier but it seems you may also be able to use this as an argument against that or to say that there was some type of prophecy outside the canon maybe not this is just one instance uh you could say that uh leaving it to all future generations is maybe a, a, an exaggeration uh which would be fair again uh, I would say, take these with a grain of salt, especially because this is something that I wasn't aware was that big of a debate, but now makes sense to me. Um, in chapter 34, verses 1 through 5, he says, The senseless have vain false hopes, and dreams give wings to fools. As one who catches a tush out of shadow and pursues the wind, so is anyone who believes in dreams. What is seen in dreams is but a reflection, the likeness of a face looking at itself. From an unclean thing, what can be clean? And from something false, what can be true? Divinations and omens in dreams are unreal. And like a woman in labor, the mind has fantasies. So when I first read this, I was kind of like, um, okay, Sira, you don't like dreams. So what? Like, I guess you can get the wrong dream and get the wrong idea from it. But uh, I really liked what the commentary says. Um, he talks about how dreams, divinations, and omens do not provide reliable knowledge. Ben Sira sets those against law and wisdom in verse 8, where he says, Without such deceptions, the law will be fulfilled, and wisdom is complete in the mouth of the faithful. Um, he may be opposing the apocalyptic movement, which emphasized knowledge through dreams and visions. Um, and so he's kind of using some language from Ecclesiastes, talking about um, kind of the vanity of dreams. And so I, I wasn't really aware that there was an anti-apocalyptic movement, um, but it makes sense, especially for uh, a more rabbinic Jew. That just, uh, I haven't heard that specifically, but it just seems that Sira is, just leans so much more towards the rabbis especially since the rabbis are talking about him so much and they don't talk about the other apocrypha. Uh, at least later on, rabbinic Jews came to really despise it because of how Christians used it. But uh, either way, uh, it seems that there was a debate in that day um, that Ben Sira was, uh, he was just outright opposing apocalypticism. Apocalypse uh, in its original uh, Greek language just refers to a revelation and not to the end of the world. Though often uh, apocalyptic lit literature, uh, that is revelatory literature, also does often talk about the end times and those that wrote it seemed to think that they knew how the end was going to happen or often believed that they were living in the end times. Uh, if you read those, which I hope to also have a um, separate season on when I uh, go through the pseudepigrapha again. But anyways, um, there are a lot of apocalyptic literature like uh, One Enoch, um, Two Enoch, uh, Three Enoch, it even is, I guess you could say more Kabbalah, which is just uh, mystical. But uh, there's also uh, One Esdras, um, Two Esdras, sorry, not One Esdras, Two Esdras, um, there's just a whole slew of these things. There were a lot of them going on in Sears' day, and so he seems to be just straight up opposing those and saying um, that those are phonies and they're false, and that you need to... Uh, he takes a more rationalist um, sort of uh, approach. Um, another thing that is um, not as likable about... Uh, Sira is his stance against the resurrection. Uh, he sees a lot in, in children. Again, it's really important to discipline your children right so that they grow up right and that you're not shamed by them um, because that's how your name lives on. Um, in fact, he explicitly says in 3821, do not forget there is no coming back. You do the dead no good and you injure yourself. Uh, to him, he believes that once you're gone, uh, you're gone. You're dead. And so uh, I think he believed in the grave and that there was a, a life there apart from the body, but that there was no resurrection. Uh, either way, he did not believe in a bodily resurrection. Um, he also, 
in uh, 43, 6 through 8, says this, It is the moon that marks the changing seasons, governing the times, their everlasting sign. From the moon comes the sign for festal days, a light that wanes when it completes it co its course. The new moon, as it ch its name suggests, renews itself. How marvelous it is in its change, a beacon to the hosts on high, shining in the vaults of the heaven. And um, like the earlier time, I, I didn't think so much of this until I read uh, the comment on it. Um, and the annotation says that the moon sets the liturgical calendar rather than the sun and the moon together, as in Genesis 1.14, perhaps indicating Ben Sira's ref um, rejection of a solar calendar used by some Jews. Um, so in 1 Enoch, for example, it talks about the necessity for uh, a solar calendar so if you didn't know this was a debate, this was a debate. Because based on what calendar you had, you would be celebrating on totally different days. Um, and I'm not super familiar with the lunar calendar, but you know, they're just, they're very different days. They just don't align at all. It's not just that they're off a month every single time, but it's just totally different days because the moon and the sun have totally different cycles as the moon goes around the earth and the earth goes around the sun. And so, uh, one Enoch totally condemns people who uh, live by lunar calendars, and Ben Sira is absolutely against uh, solar calendars. And in Genesis 1, God makes all the lights of the d day and the night to govern the times. And what it says is the, the sacred seasons, literally the seasons um, for celebrating holidays. And so uh, if you... Uh, um, if you were living in that time, those holidays were very important, and you didn't just celebrate it on whatever day. Uh, in the Torah, there's this story of um, people who were unclean on the Passover, and the Passover you're supposed to celebrate with other people, and so they come to Moses and they say, oh, well, we couldn't celebrate uh, Passover on the 14th of the first month, and so what do we do now? And uh, Moses says that there's a law where, okay, if you're, um, you're gone on vacation and you're away, uh, or you're unclean on that day, you celebrate it a month later. And so these were very important days. And um, if you're celebrating by a, a different calendar, then you just had all your days um, totally screwed up by that. Um, and then there's also an assumption that the 12 prophets are one book. I kind of talked about this. There's sort of an early version of the Kiddush. Uh, it was very close to that, as I saw in uh, chapter 50, 22 through 24. If you don't know, that's a rabbinic prayer, uh, part of Jewish liturgy that's very popular. Um, and so, yeah, those were all some very interesting things uh, that I noted in uh, Ben Sira. And again, there are teachings that are just very similar to the Sermon on the Mount and to um, James, because uh, James is wisdom literature and uh, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' charter. Um, those are all uh, those are all kind of the ideas that I had from Ben Sira. Uh, I kind of was just really using uh, my questions that I noted and uh, my overview as kind of a, a guide for this, as well as the text before me. So if you're interested in anything that that has to say, again, that's all on my website that you can find in the show notes and everything else. Uh, if, if you enjoyed this episode, please check out all the other ones for my podcast. Uh, I'm now on YouTube music for those of you who prefer YouTube music and somehow don't know that I'm on there. Um, this podcast is on YouTube music and you can find and download and listen to it there. Um, but without further ado, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next week in Babylonia.